Hey everybody, and welcome back to our series of companion guides to the Eye of the World. These videos are designed to be watched along with each chapter of the Book of the Wheel of Time. This video will cover chapter one of the Eye of the World titled An Empty Road. Like in the previous video, this video is gonna be split into two parts. The first section will be a simple recap of the chapter and will be spoiler free for anything that comes later in the series. The section is designed for those that are reading through the books for the first time and will include a recap of the story as well as some visuals, maps, pictures, all that stuff to help you understand what you just read. This is perfect to watch after finishing a chapter. The second section is gonna contain major spoilers for the rest of the series. There we're gonna get into the foreshadowing, the themes and concepts from the chapter, as well as some general thoughts that go well beyond non-spoiler talk. This section is designed for those of you that are rereading the series and want some companion information to go along with your reread. We will throw up another spoiler warning before we get to that section, so you will have ample time to turn this video off if you haven't gotten that far in the books yet. Make sure if you are a new reader not to read any of the comments on this video, as there are likely to be tons of spoiler-filled comments. You will find a timestamp in the video description that will take you to the non-spoiler section. These videos are sponsored by audible.com. You can get a free audiobook by heading to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus. Sign up for the trial, get a free book. Uh, you'll be able to listen to all of the Wheel of Time books. So let's get into An Empty Road, Chapter 1 of The Eye of the World. The chapter opens with Rand Althor and his father Tam Althor walking along the quarry road on their way to Emmons Field. Rand and his father both live out in the Westwood. It's a forest out to the west of the village of Emmons Field. They are traveling along the road with their cart horse, Bella, hauling casks of apple brandy for the Beltine Festival that will occur tomorrow. Tam brings that brandy every single year and has waited to the last minute this year to bring it to the village due to the winter being longer and more difficult. There have been reports of bears and wolves attacking humans as well as their sheep, so many residents of the Westwood have avoided travel, Tam included. As they walk along the road, Rand notices a rider garbed in black 20 paces behind him. The rider causes him to feel uneasy and fearful, but after stumbling and taking his eyes off of the rider for a moment, the rider seemingly disappears. Tam didn't see the rider at all, and so Rand thinks that he may have been seeing things when Tam questions him on it further. Eventually, they arrive in Emmons Field. The village borders the Westwood and centers along the green with a large inn to the east of the village green called the Winespring Inn. It's the largest building in the village and is home to the mayor, Bran Alvere, and his family. Now, as they enter the village, a man named Whit Conger approaches Tam and Rand as they walk towards the inn and complains to Tam about the current village wisdom named Nynaeve. He seems upset at her because the winter has gone on so long and she had predicted a much more mild winter. Tam, a member of the village council, tells Wit that the wisdom is women's circle business and Wit's wife, Daze Conger, a member of the women's circle, overhears and berates Wit. Using Daze's anger at Wit, Tam excuses himself and heads toward the inn with Rand. Many others in the village invite Tam to visit them as they walk through the town as Tam is single after his wife, Rand's mother, passed away many years before and he has not remarried. Many of the people in the Two Rivers want to try to help him remarry, but he is not interested. Now, as they approach the inn, Bran Alvir, the mayor, greets them, and Tam, Bran, and another man named Sen Bui talk about the winter and Nynaeve again. Sen is another malcontent, but he happens to be on the village council as well. As Tam and Bran admonish Sen over his complaining, Matram Cawthon, one of Rand's friends in the village, tugs on Rand's sleeve. Matt is hiding from the other adults crouched behind the cart, and he attempts to convince Rand to come with him as he and another boy, Dav Aiellen, have caught a badger and want to release it on the green to cause havoc. Rand declines, saying that he promised his father that he would unload the cider. When Matt brings up the strangers in the village, Rand mentions the rider in black that he saw along the road, and Matt says that he saw the same rider three days ago and was terrified. Matt says his father didn't believe him when he told him, so he's just been keeping it to himself. Now Tam interrupts their conversation by greeting Matt and asking him to help Rand unload the cider. He tells him that the quicker that they get the work done, the quicker that they can see the gleeman that's in town for Beltine. They learn of some of the other festivities planned for Beltine and grow more excited. A gleeman, fireworks, and and a peddler are all going to be a part of the celebration. Matt and Rand begin to unload the cider into the inn, and Rand starts to think of seeing Egwene Alvere, the mayor's daughter, who most in the village think he is going to marry. And that concludes the first chapter of The Wheel of Time. We're now going to move on to our spoiler-filled section. Please click off the video at this point if you have not finished the entire series, as we're going to be going a complete deep dive that's going to cover the rest of the books. I'm going to give you a few seconds to click off the video. You have been warned. So let's start with the foreshadowing.
I've always found it amazing that Robert Jordan foreshadowed in literally almost every single chapter of his books. The foreshadowing starts really early here with references to how Rand doesn't look much like Tam. Now this is pretty obvious foreshadowing to the fact that Tam isn't Rand's real father, and this reveal comes fairly early on in the book, but nevertheless, it's made clear within the first two pages of the book that this is true. Now the writer in black is clearly a Murdral, which we later find out, but what's of note here is how Rand notices the Murdral. It says that he feels his skin itching from the inside out, and he can feel it watching him even before he actually looks at it. Tam doesn't notice it at all and doesn't have those same feelings. Now later on, we learn that channelers can sense shadow spawn to a degree, and we see this in action with Rand in Knife of Dreams when he literally feels the army of Trollocs approaching before they attack Lord Algarn's manor. Now I initially thought this was the fact that Murdral inspire fear, uh, and that's what made Rand notice it, but actually I think it's the fact that he's a channel. Now another piece of minor foreshadowing comes later when Matt and Rand are speaking to each other about the rider, and they muse that the Dark One, or one of the Forsaken, or the Dragon might have been the rider, and this obviously has the implication that the dragon is just as bad as the Dark One or the Forsaken. Now this shows the superstitious and frankly misinformed nature of the people from the Two Rivers, and really the rest of the world. This later comes to light when Rand actually shares that he is the Dragon Reborn with Matt and Perrin, and Matt specifically starts to treat him a lot differently, like he's kind of a new person or somebody to stay away from. Now another thing from this conversation that's interesting is when speaking of the Forsaken, Matt specifically mentions Aganor and Ashamael. Now it's interesting that he mentions those two specifically, but this is obviously Robert Jordan setting up a Chekhov's gun here, as those are the two Forsaken that show up later in the book. Another thing from that conversation is where Rand mocks Matt for thinking that the Rider was one of the Forsaken, sarcastically saying that maybe it was a Shadow Man instead. Now the irony here is that a Shadow Man is another term for a Murdral, which is exactly what that Rider was. So let's hit an unanswered question from the chapter. Why is the saying the Dark One and all of the Forsaken are bound in Sheogul, beyond the Great Blight, bound by the Creator at the moment of creation, bound until the end of time? Why is that one one that caught on? It doesn't even make sense that the Forsaken were mortal men. How could they be bound at creation? Now I know we're talking about this being a long time ago. So like thousands of years ago is when the Forsaken were bound. And I know there's a lot of misinformation out in the world. It just seems like such an obvious flaw in the superstitions that these people believe. If they think that these mortal men were bound with the creator, like how would that have worked? And how would the the story that Tam told in the Raven's prologue make any sense about Luce there and sealing the boar? Again, just an interesting unanswered question. I'm curious what your thoughts on it are. So let's hit on a, a couple other general thoughts about the chapter. First of all, let's talk about what Beltine actually is as a celebration, since it's the setting for the chapter and the reason that Rand and Tam are headed to Emmonsfield in the first place. Beltine is a festival that celebrates the end of winter and the coming of spring. During the festival, large bonfires are built on the green, and a spring pole is erected by the unmarried women. Now on the day of Beltine, they're going to dance around the pole, not that type of dancing around a pole, but with ribbons. And the unmarried men are going to sing while they do it. Now, there's some strong similarities to this festival, to the Celtic festival of Bealtaine. I probably said that horribly. Um, but that takes place in the spring as well. And it's, a, like I said, it's an old Celtic festival. Robert Jordan pulled a lot of influences from older religions and older cultures. And so this is an example of that. Another thing of note here is that Matt saw the rider in black three days prior to Rand implying that the forces of the shadow have been in the two rivers longer than just that night. Now, there's certainly some calculation about what houses to attack, but it's odd that Moraine and Land did not sense the shadow spawn when they arrived in the village. Another thing that's interesting here is Bran Alvier's mention of one day Rand sitting on the village council because Rand makes a wise comment. So the implication of this is obviously that Rand is a natural leader, but obviously we know that Rand goes on to become the Dragon Reborn and the most powerful person in the world and a leader of a lot more men than a village council. So An Empty Road is an introduction to the main story of the Wheel of Time, and it sets the tone and structure for the story. Now, there are certainly very obvious similarities here to Lord of the Rings in that that's sort of like the Shire, you know, in the terms of the two rivers. Black riders are around, um, and that was very intentional on Robert Jordan's part. He wanted to pay homage to the Lord of the Rings and then move away from it and its tropes and then add to that storyline, which he definitely does as the story progresses. So what did you think of the first chapter of Eye of the World? Any other unanswered questions or thoughts that you have about the chapter? 
Leave a comment on the video and let me know what you think as we do our read through. Subscribe to the channel to be updated when I post new Wheel of Time content and make sure to click the bell icon to get notifications. I've got a playlist set up for all of these read through videos so you can just binge all of them in a row. For each of these videos, there is also a corresponding article on thegreatblight.com that has more information written, maps, links to wiki pages, all of that that's meant for new readers and all of you doing a reread. Make sure to check out the series sponsor, audible.com, to get your free audiobook. Again, www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus, get your free book. It's super simple. Thanks everybody for watching, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a rope of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?